Where do you start? The problem of starting point is the problem of metaphysics. At least that's what I believe for a long time. And I think that in a way it does encapsulate everything that is problematic about metaphysical inquiry. And the problem is, in a nutshell, that wherever you start from is going to be some kind of an assumption. And what metaphysics seeks is something, a truth, that's unqualified, absolute, not dependent on any assumptions that could be challenged. All other inquiries are quite happy to start from the assumption. They're quite happy to say, well, let's assume this and see where it leads. And that's a problem for metaphysics. And it may be that you just can't do it. You just can't. If you pretend to yourself that you're not making an assumption, you are making an assumption. Whatever you do, and however you, whatever stance you take, you're deceiving yourself. And that may be the case, but I don't think it is. I'm not interested in just exploring the consequences of some assumption. I'm interested in the truth. I'm interested in reality. I want to know how things are in reality. And if that's an assumption, if wanting to know how things are is an assumption, well then okay, I'm happy to accept that. Because, you know, you'll get some postmodernist or deconstructionist saying, well, you know, that's just a load of rubbish and there isn't any way that things are in reality. Everything's just discourse and there is no truth, there's no, there's nothing there, there's nothing real. And I just don't believe that. So that's an assumption, I'm okay with that. But obviously that's not going to take you very far, just believing that there's something real. If you have no idea where to start. So where do you start? Well, it's a matter of, you know, a purely practical um, question. Why not start where you left off? I mean, I wrote a book. I'm sorry to keep mentioning it. Naive Metaphysics. Um, there's the Pathways Program on Metaphysics. Both of those go quite a long way and cost me a lot of effort. So why not start from there? Assume that there was something right about what you did there and see where you can take it forward. And the problem is... I don't know whether I was right. I want to rethink the whole thing again, which is really what these videos is about. Trying to take a completely radical view, starting again from the beginning, and hence the problem of starting point. Okay, so if you don't start with your own philosophy, why not start with some philosopher? Descartes. Remember him? So I was going to do a video on Descartes and then realised I wasn't in the business of teaching an audience about Descartes because I've been there and done it. But Descartes makes a useful stalking horse. A stalking horse is a metaphor that Oxford philosophers liked to use in the 50s and 60s. And it, were, it, it, was, it, it was some from obscure practice in hunting, where you kind of hid behind your horse. I think that's what it was. You can look it up in Wikipedia or whatever. The idea was you pursue an inquiry by looking at a particular philosopher and examining that philosopher. And in doing so, you're actually furthering your own interests, your own inquiry, because you weren't really interested in that philosopher at all. They were just the stalking horse. Well, Descartes makes a good stalking horse because of his focus on the fact that I exist, which I think it, I'm certain of 
is of paramount importance. So maybe that's a, an assumption that I'm making, to focus on that. But I think Descartes was right. Um, <laughs> I just thought of a funny joke about putting Descartes before the horse, but never mind. <laughs> um, Generations of students are taught a load of old chestnuts about Descartes. And I think I should just mention three because it annoys me immensely. The first chestnut is Descartes was wrong to think that knowledge requires certainty. This is such a ridiculous claim. I can hardly believe it. Try telling someone who asks you, do you know that such and such and Try telling them, yes, I do know, but I'm not sure, and see what they say. You'll probably get a slap in the face. I mean, if you're not sure, you don't know. That's just basic fact about knowledge. You have to be sure. You have to be certain. It doesn't have to be some kind of absolute logical certainty, but you have to be prepared to act on what you believe. You have to be prepared to stand up for what you believe, defend it with argument or evidence or whatever. So Descartes was perfectly right to look for certainty, to look for a sufficient argument to establish his knowledge claim. And looking for certainty, assuming the very worst, assuming an evil demon and everything else, he came up with I exist, and now comes the second chestnut, because Descartes was wrong, it said, to say that I know I exist, because all I know is there is a thought. I find this also incredible, because Descartes is talking about agency. He's talking about something being done, an action of thought. And a thought doesn't think itself. This isn't anything to do with the metaphysics of substance and attributes or anything else. I exist is an action. It's a thought that I have every time I think about the possibility I'm being deceived by an evil demon. And now comes, well, actually I think there's four chestnuts. OK, but Descartes hasn't got any right to assume that he exists over a period of time. Well, guess what? Descartes never claims that when he says, in response to the evil demon hypothesis, I exist, he says, I exist is true whenever I think it. At that point, he hasn't got his thinking substance. In order to get his thinking substance, he needs God. And God, Descartes claims is responsible for keeping thinking substances and material substances in existence from moment to moment. There's no such thing as existential inertia. And Descartes was quite clever about this. I mean, the common assumption will be, well, you've got a rock. Once it exists, you don't need to do anything about it. It just keeps on existing. And Descartes would say, well, why? It's got no reason to keep on existing. A rock has as little reason to keep on existing as myself, the thing that does, says I think. So mental substance requires God, as does physical substance. And it's only because God exists that Descartes is confident in asserting that personal identity takes place, that there's such a thing as an I that continues from moment to moment, and when I say I exist, and then I say I exist again, those two eyes refer to the same thing. He's not assuming it. He takes himself to have proved it. Well, of course, um, we're not going along with him on the God theory. But again, it's a chestnut because Descartes isn't making that assumption. He's He takes himself to have proved it, and if you want to argue with Descartes, you have to question his proof of the existence of God. And the third one is about so-called Cartesian mental events, the actual thinkings themselves, the actual 
perceptions, the actual experiences that I have that I can't seem to deny. And so the argument goes, these are private objects in the sense attacked by Wittgenstein. Well, guess what? They are not. Because Descartes never assumes for a single moment that these things exist in, the, in themselves, in their own right. Descartes never thought that there could be any kind of appearance that was, that, or any kind of reality that was constituted by its own appearance. When I have a thought, a pain, or a sensation of red, there has to be an objective side. That's the point of the evil demon hypothesis. So Descartes never even considers the possibility of solipsism. In his universe, either there's an evil demon giving me my thoughts and experiences, or there's an external world, um, and of course God is responsible for the external world. An experience cannot exist on its own, that would just be a logical non just logically nonsensical. And here Descartes is showing his scholastic um, uh, education, because from an Aristotelian point of view, the idea of experiences existing just by themselves, as a solipsist would conceive them, is just inconceivable. So I like Descartes, as you can gather, I like Descartes, and I also like him because he's prepared to go for dualism, and my own theory is a dualistic theory, the theory of subjective and objective worlds. Um, you know, dualism at first sight is problematic in itself because you want everything to, to come together. You want to, there to be a unitary account of reality. And Descartes just follows what he takes to be the arguments. You just can't get, you just can't get a single thing. You have to have two things. But of course, these two things depend ultimately on a single thing, God. So that's quite a good starting point, um, you know, to go further into Descartes, and I've considered that as a possibility. But, I said this before, um, I exist, therefore what? I don't see what follows from this. I don't buy Descartes' proof of the existence of God. I don't buy Descartes' mental substance and physical substance. All I buy is this idea that my existence, the I exist, is of paramount importance. But where does it take you? So, the third possibility, the third way of starting, would be to go further back and say, what kind of inquiry do I think I am doing? What kind of philosopher am I? I was trained as an analytic philosophy, an analytic philosopher. This was at University of London, where I did my BA, and then I went up to Oxford and continued in the same vein. And at Oxford I started struggling, struggling against this and wrote a thesis, Metaphysics of Meaning, which basically tried to argue that metaphysics can't be reduced to the philosophy of language, which was the current, and still is the current view, in many ways, um, in, in, amongst analytic philosophers, that it's all about language. And I said, no, it isn't. It's about something else. It's about a dialectic, which doesn't make me a Hegelian or anything like that. Um, there's dialectic in Wittgenstein, there's dialectic in Kierkegaard. I'm straining at the leash as an analytic philosopher, but I'm certainly not a continental philosopher. You know, I'm certainly not a phenomenologist. I don't even know how to do phenomenology. I barely understand the point of it. As I said in my What is Death video, it just seems to be that phenomenologists are just giving interpretations of things. They're not saying what things are. And whenever you give interpretations, you've got more than one possibility. And Nietzsche said, you know, there's no truth, there's just interpretations. Well, then we're back to that point. I think there is a truth. Otherwise, why am I doing this? I'm not interested in an interpretation that pleases me. I want the truth. So I'm not a continental philosopher. At least that's not what I'm doing. That's not the ballpark area that I'm in. And then you've got... 
and relatively fringe movements like process philosophy, which is still going strong in some departments in the US. Um, the sort of philosophy that comes from Whitehead, Whitehead's great book, 20th Century Philosophy, um, Process and Reality. Charles Hartshorn is a, a philosophical theologian who's developed Whitehead's ideas. And then you've got Thomism, which is still very strong in Catholic universities. And I've got great respect for Aristotle. And I think there's a lot going for an Aristotelian view, especially of ultimate physics. Um, particle physics, I think Aristotelianism, may very well end up having the last word. That's, you know, that's like another story. So I kind of want to say none of the above, because I don't seem... Whatever I'm doing doesn't seem to fit into any of these categories. What I said in my book was that I just want to give an account, not in the sense of explanation, but just noting down what one has to accept as a fact. And this is how I got, reached my conclusion about the subjective and objective worlds. You have to in the light of the evidence, in the light of what we cannot but believe, you have to accept these two things as facts. The existence of the objective world, reality, existence exists, and the existence of my subjective world. Two facts. Two metaphysical facts. So, if that's the case, the task is somehow description. I am, once again, looking into myself, just as Descartes did, looking for some fact, something undeniable, that can be written down in an account. Like, I mean, the, 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 the comparison I gave was the accounts of a business. You know, profit and loss. The things, the facts that you have to accept. Before any... You know, before you even think of explanation. And uh, this goes back to my very first video, Why Am I Here? Actually, I had an, an interesting comment just a couple of days ago um, from a Muslim. I mean, I assume he was a Muslim because he quoted from the Quran. Uh, the passage which says, God, this is God speaking. I don't need your help. I don't need your sustenance. I don't need anything from you. I'm completely sufficient to myself. What I need for you is worship. And that's a very profound idea. I mean, it, the past, I mean worship has some negative connotations, but what, what it actually means is, I want your, I mean, love is perhaps a better term. Christians would understand that better. To love God, is to desire to live righteously, to love the good. The two are indistinguishable. That's what God wants. And that's what this commenter, commentator thought was the answer to my question. Why am I here? Answer, to love God. God created me in order to love him. Unfortunately, it doesn't answer the question because, as I explained in the video, that explains why God created someone like me, as it created every other person, as he created every other person, if he exists, but it doesn't explain why I had to be in the universe, why there had to be any I there at all. And the existence of I seems to be completely accidental, so far as God is concerned. And I argued in my book, Naive Metaphysics, that God occupying the view from nowhere, viewing the reality, viewing the world, the earth, solar system, from the vantage point of eternity, sub specii eternitatis, cannot see I, he can only see GVK. He can see this person as he sees every other person, but he can't see that I am this person rather than some other person. 
I doesn't fit into God's universe. And this, of course, is a major way in which I deviate from Descartes. Because for Descartes, I exist simply was proof of the existence of a substance. Descartes doesn't see the problem that I see. So, where to go from here? I wrote in an email to someone that I was discussing with this. The, the main error made by Descartes and the whole of the Western tradition is the belief that this question, whatever the question is, the problem, the metaphysical problem, has to be solved by ratiocination, by applying reason and logic. I don't think that's the case. 